Hi, my name is Chris and this is Battle Nonsense. A little bit over a year ago I did my first netcode analysis of Rainbow Six Siege followed by an update video where I tested the netcode improvements that the developers did after my initial analysis. But even after these improvements the online experience was still suffering from issues, which eventually led to the health initiative where the developers did not only work on the hitboxes, bugs and the overall balancing of the game, they also said they would improve the networking and the servers. So now that these changes went live with the Season 3 patch, it's time to take another look at Rainbow Six Siege. Now while I do my best to keep the netcode analysis as simple as possible, you will still need to have some basic knowledge about computer networking, tick rates, update rates, network models, super bullets, lag compensation and a few other things like how I do my network delay tests. So to keep the netcode analysis video short, I've put this information into a separate netcode 101 video, which you should watch at least once before you continue with this video here. The card overlay in the top right corner of this video as well as the link in the description down below will both take you directly to that video. Ok then, since day 1 Rainbow Six Siege has used dedicated game servers to host both ranked and casual matches. Custom matches could be hosted by a player or when you manage to invite the full roster of players, you could also spawn a private dedicated game server for that match. There was some confusion recently when Ubisoft announced that they will move the voice over IP system from peer to peer to dedicated VoIP servers. The primary reason why they will do this is that the peer to peer VoIP solution that the game is still using today reveals the IP addresses of your teammates. As far as I know this change is still planned to happen in the near future. Also all custom matches will move to dedicated game servers as well. Actually the requirement that you need 10 players to spawn a dedicated server instance has changed as you now only need 2 players to run a custom match on a private dedicated game server. Now where are these servers hosted? The game uses Microsoft's cloud service Azure to provide servers in South Brazil, West Coast US, Central US, South Central US, Southeast Asia, West Japan, West Europe, East Asia, North Europe, East Australia and East Coast US. On this map here you can see where the data centers are located exactly. Now which tick rates do these game servers use? The plan was to increase the tick rate from 50 to 60 Hz during the health initiative. However, at the time that I am recording this video here, the servers are still running at 50Hz as the developers notice that there are issues when they run them at 60Hz. That said, they are still working on improving the server performance to eventually increase the tick rate from 50 to 60Hz. When it comes to how much lag you experience in a game, then it's not just about the tick rate. The rates at which the client sends and receives data is also very important. So to find out how frequently the game client sends and receives data, I joined the dedicated game server and monitored the packets per second sent and received by the game client. During this test I noticed that when none of my players move, then I only receive about 16 updates per second from the server. When one of my players starts to move, then the server increases its send rate to 50Hz or 50 updates per second. And when I start to move around then you will notice that the send rate of my client also increases to a steady 60 updates per second. The latency value that you see inside the scoreboard is also interesting because you might have noticed that this value is always higher than what you see here for the data center. So which value is correct? When I spawn a dedicated game server inside the West Europe data center, then use NetLimiter or Wireshark to find the IP address of that server, search for the IP address inside IPlocation.net as well as the IP ranges list from Azure to make sure that the server is actually located inside that data center I selected and then use PSPing to ping that data center as Azure servers block ICMP, then I get about 32 milliseconds to that data center, which means that the value that we see here is in fact my ping to that data center. The reason why the value inside the scoreboard is higher is that it also includes the processing delays of the game. This is why it will increase when my frame rate decreases and why it will decrease when my frame rate increases. I would now argue that including the processing delays results in a more accurate representation of the delay that the player is affected by. However, it makes it a bit harder for players to compare their ping to servers across different games. 
Now, let's talk about the actual delay that two players experience when they play on the same server. Again, please make sure that you watched my Netcode 101 video at least once, because there I explain how I do these tests. So, at an ICMP ping of 32 milliseconds, I measured an average delay of 74.5 milliseconds for damage, 67 milliseconds for gunfire, and 92.25 milliseconds for player movement. Compared to my results from last year, that is definitely an improvement. However, games like Overwatch, Lawbreakers or CSGO offer much lower delays, which means less lag. So there is clearly room for improvement here. In a game like Rainbow Six Siege, where you can't just respawn after you died, it's imperative that the hit registration is fair. If you play Rainbow Six Siege, then you know that it's quite common to have players with more than 200 milliseconds latency in your match. And the way how Rainbow Six Siege handled shots fired by these players could result in situations that were more than infuriating. So how does the game now handle a situation like this one here? Where we have one player with a stable ICMP ping of 32 milliseconds to the server and another one with 300 milliseconds to the server, because he either connected to a data center very far away or because he is suffering from network congestion and his router does not prioritize data from real-time applications such as online games. Well, I dare to say that this still leads to an infuriating experience for players who have a good and stable connection to the server. Sure, he was visible to the high ping player when he shot him, but this does not change that he was behind cover again on his monitor when he received that shot. This is without a doubt an infuriating experience considering that it is caused by the bad connection of that other player and how it is handled by the Rainbow Six Siege server. But that's not all. Yesterday it happened to me that I died while standing outside of a building and looking into a window. Sadly, I got so mad when I died that I stopped the recording. I really wish I didn't, because in the replay I then saw that the player who seemingly shot me from inside the building actually first jumped out of the window and then opened fire, which I didn't see. And that is not the only strange thing that is currently happening in this game. The forums and Reddit are filled with strange game and experience breaking glitches that simply must not happen in any online multiplayer game but especially not in a game like Rainbow Six Siege where you have just one life. Now that we have almost reached the end of this updated netcode analysis, there is one more thing that I would like to show you. And this is how much traffic Rainbow Six Siege generates. After I played casual matches for one hour, the game uploaded 27.48 MB and downloaded 35.01 MB of data. What I want to show you here is how much or little traffic is generated by today's online multiplayer games. Unlike my netcode delay tests, this is by no means a rating or a ranking. And this brings us to the end of this video. I hope that you enjoyed the updated netcode analysis of Rainbow Six Siege and if you like my in-depth netcode and input lag tests where I show you how these affect your gaming experience, then you can help to cover the costs of this channel by supporting me on Patreon. Without the support of my patrons, I really could not continue to bring you this kind of content, as the ad revenue generated on YouTube is mostly not even enough to pay for the Adobe Creative Cloud subscription at the end of the month. So if you want to support me as well, then you can find the link in the description down below. Also, if you want to stay up to date on what I'm currently working on, then you can follow me on Twitter or Facebook, the links are also in the description of this video. And if you don't want to miss the next one, then you might want to subscribe to my channel and click on that little bell icon below this video to receive a notification when I upload the next one. So if you enjoyed this video, then please give it a like, subscribe for more and I hope to see you next time. Until then, have a nice day and take care. My name is Chris and this was Fatal Nonsense.